Which Side Podcast is a proud member of the Which Side Media Collective. So, uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying really hard not to make a joke about this episode, because it's episode 69. I don't get how you can make a joke out of an episode 69. I don't either. There's nothing funny about 69. It's a fucking number of an episode. So we have Carl Orjachowski on. He's the director of Maximum Tolerated Dose. Yeah, we had a really good time talking. Talk. You know, and you can download it now on his website. So, you know, hope you enjoy and then go buy the movie and educate yourselves. Yeah, um, right now I think he even has like an economy version. So if, if you can't... It's like eight bucks. Or it's like eight bucks for like the full version or yeah. five bucks for the version without special features. You guys can afford that. Yeah. So go Crazy. drop your money on that. What events do we have going on this week? Uh huh. Um, you know what? Write a local prisoner. That's the events going on. Yeah. Don't be lazy. They fucking need it. They do. Yeah. But <clears throat> 1971, March 1st, the Weather Underground bombs the U.S. Capitol building. How'd that go for them? Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Hey, I'm Jordan. Hey, and I'm Jeremy. Hi, how are you? Doing well. well. How are you doing? Good. So sorry, we're just getting all set up. So sorry about my voice. I don't know what the the fuck's going on today. <clears throat> it's all right. I don't even like feel sick or anything. It just I've never I've never heard your voice, so it sounds normal to me. Well, <laughs> then this is perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how you doing today? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm sorry if I was late. I uh, I didn't have Skype on, so I uh, didn't get your contact request, and then I was, and then I got your email, and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> I <gotta laughs> do this thing again. I have like a, my a, my calendar reminds me at the beginning of each day like what I have to do, but sometimes I just like I feel like I need just like someone to just be like, hey, remember. Like for, you know, like in the middle of the day, I need someone to be like, okay, like it's the middle of the day. What do you have to do now? <laughs> I'm the same way. I never know what's going on. I ignore my <laughs> calendar half the time. Jordan shows up and he's like, hey, are you fucking ready? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's Saturday? What the fuck? <laughs> right. So, um, so how long have you been vegan? Uh, since 2005. What what brought you um, to veganism? So nine years. Um, uh, well, I went vegetarian in 2001 uh, after a propaganda show. And then uh, I had been, like, m- mostly vegan by about 2005. Like, I, w- I was never, like, a, a cheese guy. Like, I liked, uh, like, I liked, like, shitty cheese you know like craft singles and fucking cheese whiz <laughs> and shit like i like that i wasn't like ooh, i need fancy cheese like i i wasn't into that stuff um and i never really ate e- i mean i ate eggs here and there i was i was in just starting university uh at the time and so my mom would like bring me like egg salad and stuff like that and i would eat eggs then but i was most i was mostly vegan um And that year, uh, I started um, working on a radio show based in Toronto called Animal Voices. And the host of that show, uh, Lauren Corman, was also, um, who is now Dr. Lauren Corman, Um, she was uh, also a a teaching assistant at uh, at York University, and she would, um, she didn't as a teaching assistant, you don't really have a lot of say in what goes into your courses, but um, I knew that she did the radio show, 
uh, from the class, and I started listening to the radio show, and and uh, she did a lot of cool shows that year. Like uh, she had interviewed like Josh Harper about uh, about anarchism and animal rights, and I was really into anarchism. And you know, she had done shows about like dairy and eggs specifically that that I had listened to that really. Uh, affected me and then uh, like at the end of my academic year in 2005 I wanted to start volunteering for the show and I kind of figured like if I was gonna be teching this like animal rights radio show like I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't not be vegan so uh, <laughs> it was kind of like a well I got, it was almost like oh, I got to do this thing for this job you know and uh, but I mean it's nine years later now and it's I mean, I don't work on the radio show anymore, but I wouldn't stop being vegan. So, so, so you went vegetarian after a punk show. Yeah, I'm curious yeah. about that. Like, what the hell happened at that punk show? <laughs> I was, and well, you know, it was nothing really specific. Like, like I was, I was already really heavily into uh, political stuff. This was uh, the 2001. Uh, like, I've I've been to college and university, so. Uh, this was when I was in my first year of college, and uh, I, but I had already been into political issues for a long time before that. Like I was really into uh, like anarchism and like anti-consumerist activism in my teens, and a lot of that was because of punk bands, like like and especially bands like Propaganda. But I always kind of looked at bands that talked about animal rights. Like, Propaganda was kind of the only one that I listened to at the time. I n I'd never gotten into, like, Earth Crisis and stuff like that. Um, so, I always, I mean, I was really down with everything that Propaganda was about. I was, I thought they were sh super sharp politically, but I would look at the animal rights stuff and go like, yeah, yeah, you know, like, except for that. <laughs> like, I was kind of like, I was just kind of like, you know, it's, it's all cool, except for, you know, I mean, don't, don't tell me what to eat, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah. And then there was something that, that was the first time I had seen them live. And so, uh, I don't know, there was something about that show that really affected me. They ended the show with Purina Hall of Fame and it was really, uh, you know, it was just like, intense and and i got home that day and or that night and i was just kind of like i don't really need to eat i mean e not eating meat is it's pretty easy <laughs> like you don't have to you know like it was really i just felt like lazy like after after kind of absorbing the show and and getting home and seeing like a freezer full of meat, I was just like, man, I'm just lazy. Like this is really not difficult to to. You just don't put it in your mouth, you know. Like <laughs> you just eat something else. <laughs> like it's not, you know, being vegetarian has always been really easy, and I I really. I still to this day don't really get people who are like, oh, it would be so hard. Like every restaurant, has, I mean, I can I can still somewhat understand people being like, well, being vegan must be so hard. I still think that's lazy, but I think it's it's way more lazy to not even be vegetarian. <laughs> like <laughs> to just look at it. To I mean, the, there's so many vegetarian options everywhere everywhere I, yeah i've always liked to tell people the the hardest choice is just making it the hardest thing like is making sure. that choice like everything else is fucking easy at that point yeah so uh, i you know it was kind of like i was already into the issues i was kind of uh like ashamed at at my the sheer like amount of my laziness on that on that one particular issue <laughs> and uh and it was easy after that i mean Going vegan was also pretty easy because I had a, you know, I had people like Lauren and a couple other people uh, around me who helped, you know, like this is this is nutritional yeast, like try this, and like this is veganase, like see, like you can totally have mayonnaise still. <laughs> and, I, I wish I had. I that. mean, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't like, have that mentor. I, I remember trying to find nutritional yeast for the first time. I had no yeah. fucking idea what it even was. And was this like, like, when did you go vegan? Uh, it was 13. 
So how I well, I like don't 20, know how long 20 years. Was. Yeah, so yeah. I mean back then it would have been even more difficult, you know, like at the I don't have that kind of cre- like I've been vegan for nine years, but I still don't feel like I ha- you know have that kind of cred to be like back in my day like we know <laughs> like, I know, like like I know vegans who are like we only had rice stream like that's all we had you know there was no there was no million different kinds of like vegan ice cream there was no vegan as we had rice cream. Nay-o-nays. Nay-o-nays. we had yeah, nay-o-nays. Nay-o-nays. Yeah, disgusting. Yeah. We had mayonnaise, we had rice stream, and like the new farm vegetarian cookbook, and that was it. And I'm just oh, like, God. Yeah, it was terrible. Box, <laughs> box soy yeah, milk so, on the shelf. It was fun times. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, I mean, now it's even easier, and I think people who aren't vegan or vegetarian are even lazier than I was. It's, it's really true. It's, so, I mean, yeah. So stepping back a little bit, um, I've never seen Propagandi live. I love them, so I'm a little jealous. I've just never had the opportunity. But um, what's your favorite song? Um, that's a tough one, actually. I th- I really uh, I know a lot of a lot of people really like the early era stuff, but I think when when John Sampson left the band and they went in a more like heavy thrash mm-hmm. direction that they got way better <laughs> um uh that's a that's i'll, a tough I'll tell you mine I mean, mine is coach's song. corner yeah i would say the same really too, which is a newer song which is weird but are you guys but are you guys like hockey fans no, no not at all not at all because <laughs> to me i mean it's 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 interesting to hear you guys say that because that song has like a lot of like inside references to like canadian geography and like and, and maybe i actually learned a lot by the yeah. song like but i just yeah. like that it's like it's confronting like this institution in there like it's you know yeah, yeah well at the it same is. time like it's uh, what i appreciate about that song is that like it's confronting it but it's coming from a place of like uh, from a place of love you know like the those guys fucking love hockey like they love it and they play it and they like, you know, Chris Hanna like talks about, you know, like during the playoffs, he, or not even during the playoffs, like during the season, he like tweets about his favorite teams. Like he's <laughs> into it. It's not, uh, but he also, I think sees ways that it's fucked up. And I've always, I've always, I've always kind of liked that about them is that they have a way of like dissecting things that are really, close to them it's not it it's never really just felt like abstract like yeah okay now we got to write a song about like nationalism and now we got to write a song about what I, you know they're not just like they don't just have a bunch of topics that they're trying to like cover it's like this it, you get the sense that like i mean that song the story of dear coach's corner is like he went to, uh, he was at a hockey game with his, uh, nephew, like, right? niece? with his nephew, yeah. yeah, or his niece or his nephew, and, like, watching this fucking, like, military exercise weird thing happening during one of the intermissions and, like, how fucked up that was, right? And so it's it's using this, like, personal thing to get at this larger, like, larger political thing. I've always really liked that about them. Yeah, yeah I really like that. And maybe that's why I like the song so much. It, it it seems so personal. It seems like um a conversation you just have with like your buddy about like why you think this is wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, so do you guys? See, I don't even think you guys would see the show. Like Coach's Corner is like a, um, it's like it plays during intermissions on Hockey Night in Canada, which is like a nationwide broadcast of of hockey games really? really and uh the the person that they're talking that the song is addressed to is uh ron mclean who's like this kind of like uh like very like weak willed kind of guy he's like the sidekick of the main guy uh don cherry who's like a a fucking like brash like really uh he's kind of like a classic conservative like he's almost like an american style like like a uh, republican guy like that's kind of what he seems like and ron mclean is this like 
He's like, uh, fuck, I'm trying to think of those guys on... He's like the the dude on Fox. He's like the one dude on Fox who's like a liberal. <laughs> okay. Oh, the one that got fired a while ago. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, what's his I don't name? Know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I only know about these people from like the Daily Show. <laughs> 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 so, like, but anyway, there's this one guy. He So Ron McClain is like this kind of weak dude that is the sidekick to this like Republican guy. And yeah, the, it's, it's it's funny to think like I've never really thought about the song in that way as like, man, people from other countries must not know what the fuck this song is about. Like, who's I always thought it was to a, the coach of the team. No, co- no, coach's corner is like a it's like where they analyze the plays and yeah, stuff like that. That makes a lot yeah. of sense now that you explain yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, it's maybe. I didn't know I maybe who it was. Should, but I, I maybe just... should have just let you had your own interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let me tell you exactly what's going on. I still like it. It's still, yeah. I think it's a great song. So yeah, well, that's cool. <laughs> so you still never said yours. I I really don't know. I mean, I like their uh, I like their uh, animal rights songs a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one song off Failed States. Uh, status update that I really liked. Um, I really, really liked. Uh, uh, I'm going to forget the title. Oh, it was called Potemkin City Limits, but it was on uh, the next album after that. I'm, well, I'm blanking. The song about Francis the pig uh, escaping from the from the slaughterhouse. That was one of that's probably one of the i mean they only propaganda is one of those punk bands one of those they're the only one that like they have songs that make me like want to cry <laughs> like just start yeah. crying because they're just so like so heavy and uh and that's one of those songs for sure I, i'm i'm surprised like they every album that they release, even like the newer ones, like Felt States, it's just every time it's just like now this is like my fucking favorite album. Like, yeah. Felt States is great. Yeah, and the t- the time of the amount of time that it takes me to completely me- like I always feel like as I'm getting older, my my ability to like memorize albums is I'm losing it. But I'm always amazed at how quickly I can like memorize a propaganda album. <laughs> I've never had it. I am so terrible. <laughs> Uh, I'm the same. I'm not good at it. Yeah, I'm I'm terrible. Like I own every Earth Crisis album. I couldn't even tell you all their names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've seen every show they've ever had in Utah. And I can tell you about the shows. Right. Fuck everything else. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh. So what led you from uh, going vegetarian to working at a radio show being vegan? to then being on the forefront of documentary making. <laughs> well, I should I should correct you. I'm just certainly not at the forefront <laughs> of anything. Well, as far as vivisection documentaries go. Sure. <laughs> all all three of them. <laughs> like, no, it's it's funny cuz uh in um in Canada like the well, and kind of everywhere else like I think Generally speaking, uh, animal rights documentaries are are fairly like marginal, and they're getting they're starting to become more of like a a bigger thing. But they're they're still such a like as they say in the industry, like a niche, <laughs> like a niche uh, genre. Um, uh, I started doing film around two thousand six. Uh, I was in university and I had, uh, taken a, a course about, um, uh, it was called, uh, feminism and film. And it was a, a course led by a prof at, at this university. And this, this prof was like, she was a filmmaker and she made a lot of these kind of like really personal, quirky, funny, sad kind of like animated short films and she did it with like almost no money or really no money. I mean like you know in in filmmaking like 
$250,000 is considered like a small budget, which is hilarious to me. I'm just like, man, yeah. you guys are fucking crazy. <laughs> um, but uh, she, I mean, she made all the, she, she made all these films for almost for really, you know, pennies. And, uh, and we watched a lot of other films in that class that were just amazingly cool, uh, political, uh, interesting films, you know, short films, full length films, documentaries, fiction, all kinds of stuff. And the, the thing that kind of like was the unifying aspect of them apart from that they were all you know dealing with like feminist issues was um a lot of them were made for almost nothing and it was the first time that i had kind of realized like oh you can totally do films like in a punk way like i always thought like <laughs> oh it'd be fun it'd be fun to make films but like let's be honest like i'm not i'm never gonna have that kind of money <laughs> uh, so you know, like, just forget about it. Um, and so that was the first time that I thought, oh, maybe I could do this. Too. It was like a DIY moment where I was like, I could, you know, maybe I could I could do this. So I started making little weird short films uh, and uh, kind of getting into stuff uh, a bit more. And over the next few years, uh, I continued to make, like, weird short films. And then... Uh, and then I started turning my eye towards, I mean, I had been vegan by then for four or five years and, uh, animal issues were always important to me. And, um, and so, yeah, I just started looking at, at animal stuff, like as a, as a thing to document and, uh, started doing some films about, animal issues and then uh in 2010 I was just kind of looking for like I wanted to do a feature which sounds like a weird thing to say but it was I had done like shorts uh, up to about 15 minutes and I was like well I could make something bigger like I know that I have the skill to do it like I have equipment I have an editing suite I can I know how to work editing software i know i could do this if i had a subject so i was just kind of like keeping my eyes open for something like that to happen and and that year i ended up uh kind of in this happenstance way like um talking to a couple people who had been former lab workers and or like former researchers and former lab workers and uh yeah their their stories were just I don't know why I'd never really thought about that as like an angle, but I think it was the combination of like, I was looking for this, like I was looking for a project. And then I was also kind of, yeah, I was talking to these, you know, I'm, I'm really, that was the thing that was awesome about the radio show too, is like every week Lauren would interview like someone new and they always had something really interesting to say and i've always loved like i i did a music blog for a long time and um interviewed musicians i love interviewing people like i just love finding out what people have to say about stuff and it's amazing how much i mean listen to how much i'm talking now like if you genuinely are interested in what someone has to say they will talk to you for a long time <laughs> and so <laughs> Uh, yeah, these people kind of like came into my life in this like happenstance way. And I was like, wow, there's totally, there's totally like an angle here. And, uh, I started kind of putting the idea out there, like through various contacts that I had, I started saying like, uh, you know, I'm interested in making this film. Like, do you know anybody else who might, who might want to be in it? And so, uh, yeah, like I just, it was kind of talking to those two people and then also putting the idea out there among, like among friends and among contacts that it just started generating more people and, and more things to film. And that, and that was kind of how the film ended up starting and getting made. And, um, some people have, you know, I've, I've often heard people refer to it as like, the only uh, full-length documentary about the section, which is not true. Uh, there's a cu there's a couple of other ones that I can think of off the top of my head. One is a there's a full-length 
a documentary about vivisection that was produced in South America, actually, uh, kind of in the mid 2000s. Um, and there's also a film called uh, One Small Step, which is about um, U.S. Uh, experiments on monkeys uh, in space flight. And that's, I mean, it's not a film about vivisection per se, but it totally is. And um, yeah, the, I just, I guess, yes, to, to sort of answer your question about like how it ended up as the, there's just not a lot of films out there about the <laughs> subject, you know? There's like, there's stuff about animal issues, there's stuff about, you know, health there's stuff about uh you know there uh, there are films that cover a lot of different angles uh in terms of animal rights but there's really not a lot that covers vivisection so uh i feel like in a way if i'm at the forefront of that it's probably mostly by default <laughs> <laughs> you know vivisection is one of the, the the hardest things for me to talk about with people because on a moral aspect, I think it's very easy to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, on a scientific aspect, it's mostly above my head. Um, like, how, how did you confront the, 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 those issues? Like, you mean in terms of, like, uh, sort of understanding the science and, and that sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, you know, because, you know, I mean, it's easy to talk about, like, the moral implications of animal testing. I think, you right. know, the, the moral distinctions are pretty clear. But um, the, the I can, on a very brief level, be like, well, you know, it doesn't really cross species very well, but I can't go more into depth. Do you right. know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, uh, the, thing that, the thing that a lot of people ask and the thing that I've always been really, uh, like, really forthright about with my film was, like, I don't... I'm not a scientist. I don't come from a scientific background. Uh, when it comes to most scientific issues, no matter what, I mean, I can, I can quote studies to you. Like I can talk about, you know, what the, I can talk about studies that have talked about, you know, you know, how well, uh, animal experimentation translates to people and what the like f frequency is of, of failure and all of that stuff. But ultimately, like I always tell people when it comes to scientific data and picking a side in terms of the scientific argument, unless you are a scientist yourself, which most people aren't, uh, you're, you're mostly taking somebody's word for it. Like mm -hmm. I believe I tend to believe scientists who are opposed to vivisection more than scientists who are pro-vivisection. Uh, but that's not really, like, I don't believe them because I've read all of the studies and understood every single thing about it. I just believe them because it's, I mean, to be honest, it's more convenient for me to believe them. <laughs> but that's not, I mean, I think we all do that. Like, the the, the people who believe, uh, you know, like, the Foundation for Biomedical Research or who, uh, you know, these other lobby groups that are, like, pro-vivisection lobby groups or, whoever, you know, people who believe mainstream scientists who say that uh, vivisection works, they're, they're doing the same thing. They're just going, yeah, I, you know, this scientist says this, so I believe that, and that works for me because it doesn't challenge me, so that's great. Um, I've always kind of looked at the, the issue from a different perspective. You mentioned before, like, you know, the moral implications are pretty clear, but I actually think that i i mean i think they're clear once you have a conversation about them but i i think most people aren't really willing to have the conversation or they've had like a they've had like a mini conversation in their head but they haven't really uh thought the issue through and there's still i think there's still a pretty wide perception that like you know that the that the calculus around vivis that the moral calculus around vivisection is like yeah i mean of co of course i would rather have like a, a mouse die than my daughter you know like mm -hmm. i think people think about it in these weird like fucked up like terms of like 
yeah, one for the other. I, of, yeah, yeah, of course I'd rather have a dog die than than my kid or like my grand, you know, like uh, uh, yeah, a monkey is who cares about a monkey? I care about my grandma, you know, yeah. like stuff, you know. So, um I think that uh you know, those those moral conversations are still not uh happening a lot and um I, I yeah i just i i always tell people like i'm not a scientist i'm not interested in throwing statistics at you uh i i'm a filmmaker i tell stories i want you to hear the stories of of actual people who have done it like these people have way more authority to talk than i do and they have way more authority to talk than you do. <laughs> it's, it's not, I mean, it's, and I don't even mean like authority as in like, oh, this person's a doctor. I mean, authority as like, no, no, like it's, it's like war, right? Like it's really easy to talk about war and to have an opinion about war. But then when you talk with someone who's actually been through it, all of a sudden you feel like you got to shut up because you're like, oh, right. Like, I don't really know. Uh, I'm just talking in like abstract terms. Like mm -hmm. it's it's just a thought exercise for me. Um, so I I just thought these these folks had something really interesting to say, and I always kind of present the present the issue that way. Like these are these are first these are first hand these aren't like people talking about other people that they know. These are people talking about their own actual experiences and. For me, like, I always wanted to look at, uh, you know, the, the, the moral and psychological toll of vivisection. Like, I, was, I wasn't, we, we know that animals die. We know that uh, science continues to go forward and that sometimes it finds cures for things. Those things are like, I mean, talking about that stuff is kind of like, well, okay, like what else is new? But, um, yeah, I just, I think if people want to have a scientific conversation, that conversation can happen. But, uh, having a scientific conversation amongst like, like me having a scientific conversation with someone who's also not a scientist to me is just like hilarious. I'm just like, man, <laughs> we, we sound like, like we are just like, you know, you know, when people say like, well, they did a study. It's like, that's what it sounds like. It's like, yeah. well, they said this. Well, they said that. It's like, they said, they said, like no one, no one actually knows anything. <laughs> just like bullshitting out loud. <laughs> and yeah. No but, anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. Who's they? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never never thought about it in those terms, but you're right. It's just confirmation bias on both sides mm -hmm. going back and forth. Yeah, and you know, there's nothing like we ju we just do we just do that and it's not uh I I'm not making a judgment on people who do that cuz I do it. But it's just kind of like be let's just be honest about it and if you want to if you want to discuss things on a scientific level that's fine but can we just please recognize that neither of us know what the fuck we're talking about <laughs> like it's it might as well we might as well be talking about like magic tricks you know like oh, well, I saw a magician do this magic trick, and, well, I saw one do this magic trick, and it's like, well, I mean, the numbers mean mean very little to me. <laughs> like, it just, it just looks, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> sure. So, so while you're making this, I can't imagine um, the, the emotional ups and downs it would take, you know, between do, researching the studies and maybe seeing video or seeing you know, pictures and everything. Like, how did you decompress and, like, be able to handle all, all of that through the project? Um, it, you know, there's that, like, cliche, and I feel like people uh, often do that thing that's really um, kind of, like, uh, it's like, like a false modesty thing where they go, like, well, you know, the animals have it harder. And I I agree the animals do have it harder. Um, uh, and I often thought about that 
for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I think, I think I was, uh, a bit more able to do it cause I do like I do, I've done other investigative work. I've edited, uh, other people's investigative, uh, videos that they've done. Like I, I deal with, with pretty gruesome footage, like a fair, a fair bit. And so it's not, and people I know, like I know other people who are investigators and when we watch footage, like we're not really, it's, it sounds kind of gross, but we're not really like, oh man, this is so fucked up. Like we just look at it and go like, you know, well done, good job. Like good for you for getting that footage. Like, yeah, you can hear every, oh, did you hear what he said? You know, like we look at it in a really technical way and when I'm editing, it's also a really technical thing too. Like I'm not, eh, I mean, of course I'm thinking about the emotional content because I'm trying to structure a story that's going to, you know, it can't, it can't just be like jumping from one kind of tone to the next. You have to kind of build uh, an emotional tone as you go along, but like uh, it's still a, it's hard, it's hard to describe, but it is a really technical exercise and it's not, um, it doesn't really come until later, uh, when you're, when sort of the, the process is done and then you can kind of let this story kind of sink in a little bit more, um, with doing the investigative work, uh, like one of the investigations that we did for the film was, uh, going to Laos and, and, uh, infiltrating monkey farms there and that was that was super stressful um but it wasn't i mean it wasn't i mean stress is an emotion but it wasn't like emotionally like i wasn't coming home and crying after i was like i was you know getting back to the place where we were staying at the end of the day and kind of um like I was more stressed out because it's like I'm pretending to be someone else in a fucking country where people disappear all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was more stressful because like I'm dealing with people who I felt like would, you know, they're like the people who own the monkey farms in Laos are like gangsters. You know, it's like if they were going to they're not bank robbers, but if they were going to rob a bank they would walk in and just shoot everybody so they don't have to deal with it. You know, it's like, they're just, they're, fu they're fucking hard people. And, uh, you know, so it was stressful on a level of like, man, I gotta just be cool. It's <laughs> like, I can't, you know, cause I don't want to be like, Oh, my life depended on it. But it was like, I didn't want to find out what would happen if like, they were like, we found out that you're a, what a, you're an animal rights person. They, they don't even really have, you know, animal rights isn't even really on the radar there in the same way, but it's like, if they thought we were trying to fuck up their business, it would be bad. It would be really bad. So it was stressful in that way. And when I was out of that country, I was much happier. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, making the film was was emotionally, it was kind of, it was draining. It, I was putting in like really long hours. Like it was probably about six months of editing for like 10 hours a day. But uh, it didn't really hit me emotionally until like the film was done. And then I could be like, Oh yeah, like this happens and that's so shitty. You know, Dur during the editing, it's more like, I don't know. It still feels too long or like this is, the scene is kind of like dragging on. It's, it's all really technical and it's, it doesn't, it doesn't get like sad until, until later. So, so how did you get into these uh, monkey farms in Laos? Uh, I mean, without getting too much into it, uh, investigative work in general requires uh, lying to people. I mean, <laughs> you, you can't. Well, I mean, it's not. You know, it, it's. I mean, it's. It sounds kind of funny. It's. It's actually like my least favorite thing about it. it it kind of feels like a cross between like acting and 
uh, like being a con artist or like a secret agent or something like that, you know, where like you're telling people that you're one thing and you're really not that like you're you're the opposite of what you're saying. Um, so the monkey farms in Lao, it was uh again without getting too into specifics basically uh we were posing as like a um uh, like as animal dealers who were looking for monkeys for for a research laboratory and it's a certain kind of like uh with any investigative work too there's a certain amount of like like jedi mind trick thing <laughs> that happens where you're just kind of like like yes i you know like you even even when you think like you might look at a person and go oh they look like they could never do investigative work they look too much like a punk or too much like a whatever it's like if you approach somebody with the right amount of confidence and you just don't break your story um there's uh, it's like a magical thing that happens where they just believe you <laughs> and so <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we were we were we were posing as animal dealers, and I, I mean, I'm looking at myself in the mirror before going to these places, and I'm like, I don't fucking like, come on, <laughs> like this is gonna this is gonna be a bloodbath, you know, like no one's gonna no one's gonna believe us, but um, we we kind of just we had some location information that we had gathered uh once we got to the kind of like we had we knew the locations of a few farms we had mapped them out on like google earth and um we had i had hired like a, a translator and a driver uh who the translator and driver like the same person and uh we were paying the translator I was I was paying the translator really well, <laughs> um, and so it it was it was useful too because like they they had an interest in making sure things went smoothly, you know. So we had this like person in in Lao who was like who could speak the language and and who could translate that was really interested in seeing these deals happen because like you know the more business I do, the more they're going to get paid and and. Um, it was yeah we we ju we just literally like rolled up on monkey farms and like not you know like d drove up to the gate and we're like hey this is you know here's a here's a fake business card and here's a fake like <laughs> like you know and just like this is what I'm looking for and can we talk and so uh you know we would generally speaking before the cameras cameras would roll uh i had you know, one or more meetings with the owners to talk business and to sort out various details about price and and that sort of thing. And then and then we would, and then I would, you know, I would give them different reasons for filming. I'd be like, well, you know, so, uh, you know, my my friend here who has a camera, like, could he just film a few things like while we talk, just so that I can, you know, so that we have like a reference for. <laughs> When, when we go back to North, you know, and, I mean, it's not, I, I want to be clear too. Like these people are not stupid. Like it's not that. I mean, when you, when you know, you know what the purpose of the investigation was like you, you, you too, like mm -hmm. you guys know what the purpose was. These guys don't have any idea and they're in business, you know, if they're, and especially when you're over in that part of the world, like people with white skin in Southeast Asia are like walking dollar signs. Mm -hmm. They don't know that I, they don't know that I can barely fucking pay rent in, <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> you know, they don't know that. And so they're not, it, it's not stupid and they're not easy they're not being easily fooled it's like they have no reason to believe otherwise really and uh it's it's because of like the kind of nature of how like how little we know about each other i mean i gave them I gave different monkey farmers like a fake name. All of them looked that up on the internet to see if they could 
find something like they and they would bring me papers with the fake name on it you know printouts from like uh like google and stuff with my with that my fake name in the search box and and say like is this you and i'm just like well no those websites aren't mine but like that's my name um so like they had no reason to believe that i wasn't who i was or so, saying who i was and so, so how do you pick a fake name that they can look up uh i it was similar i used basically the the same first name but a different last name it, it, there's this like um like undercover police and people working like investigative work or undercover work they generally say like you 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 can learn to answer to another first name but you'll never be able to not answer to your actual name like if i walked in to a room like jordan you're in a room mm -hmm. and you had been telling me this whole time that you were i don't know blake or something yeah. and you you know but i walk into a room and you're facing the other way and i say because I know I'm blowing your cover and I walk into a room and I say, Jordan, like you are, you physically cannot ignore that because yeah, it's yeah. been your name your whole life. So it's better to just use your real first name <laughs> for everything. Um, so I use the same first name and then I just like made up, a I made up another Polish last name that was like total, you know, it was, it was actually pretty similar to my own, but I was like, well, I looked it up before. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, you know, just to make sure it doesn't say like, did you mean, <laughs> you know, because that would be a disaster. But um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's, yeah, I just, I, I want to be clear that, yeah, the, it, those folks are not, they weren't easily fooled. It wasn't, I mean, we had to have, we had to have talks before. We had to, like, there was trust that had to be established. It had to be established fairly fast, you know, like I might have met with them for a few hours on a couple different days. But I mean, if you talk with someone for six hours, they, you, you know, and all you've talked about is business and they seem to know what they're talking about. I mean, they, they have no reason to be like, well, it's, you know, this fucking guy might be a whatever. Mm hmm. So like you did, just kind of believe it. Did your translator know what was like the truth behind it, or they just thought you were uh, really there? No, he didn't know. It was it was actually uh, really like the circumstances of it were pretty hairy. Like in in the sense that like we were all like I think he was he meaning the translator. Like I think he was not lying to us but there were certain things that he told us that i knew were not true like he told us uh, you know if you if you ever wanted to like live in lao i could help you buy a house now i know that foreigners can't buy homes in lao like i just know that because my friends lived there and you can't buy a home if you're not a lao citizen mm -hmm. and so you know he's saying you know i can help you buy a house and i'm like oh i thought i couldn't I thought I couldn't own property here. And he's like, oh, no, no, you can. And I'm just like, okay. You know, so there was certain things where, like, I felt like he was not being absolutely truthful with us. And then there was also, I mean, the conversations we would have with uh, with the monkey farmers where it would be, like, a lot of back and forth, you know, like a lot of, like, back and forth in a language that I don't even... I can't even begin to, uh, like, decipher it. You know, if I hear people talking in Spanish, I can be like, yeah, okay, they're talking about this. Mm -hmm. But this is like, I don't know what the fuck is being said. And then it's like, you know, uh, he, says, he says yes. <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> okay, like, what else did, you know, you guys were talking for like five minutes. So like, what, you know, I don't know what is being said about me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, our, our translator didn't know. Um, and I think, you know, I, I mean, we had, we had, we definitely had discussions about that because there's an ethical component to that too, because I mean, he's dealing with 
these are, you know, the monkey farmers are fucked up characters. Uh, and so, like, there was definitely an ethical conversation that had to happen there where we were like, is this going to put this guy at risk? And we ultimately decided, like, it would be easy for him to plead ignorance because, I mean, why, you know, like, he's another Lao guy. And they're not, like, they're not going to... I mean, I, to be honest, I don't even think that... I mean, I know that the investigation had some impact there, but the one of the monkey farmers is actually, like, a, a well-known... Uh, like a really well-known international like wildlife trading kingpin and the uh, I mean he uh, like one of one of the other monkey farm owners was like a general in the military you know like these are people who are not really like touchable in in that way and so like I don't think they would have reason to kind of like uh, enact any like retribution on this guy because he, re I mean, one, he didn't do anything wrong, and two, like, I mean, who cares? Like, they they probably never saw him again. Mm -hmm. Um, because he, I mean, <laughs> I just I just thought the the translator was like, well, what a, you know, like he's used to like tour buses and like people kind, you know, like people being like, hey, can you take me to like a uh, like a cool temple or something. I was just like, I want to buy monkeys. <laughs> like, when, you know, <laughs> this guy was like a guy that we found at like the tour agency. You know, mm -hmm. uh, he was used to like, yeah, like dr drive, you know, drive us around the t town, show us like cool like mountains and stuff like that. No, I don't want to. Yeah, but so it was like he was he looked at us and it kind of in a way like well whatever okay like whatever you want to do <laughs> you're paying me so sure so is is that the normal way that um that that primates are, are purchased from laos like is an agent would actually have to go there there's not like an intermediary <laughs> like in the united states well this is a or this canada is a, or... this is a question that i didn't really ask myself <laughs> at the time and i i don't know if i really even still want to know the answer to that because i think uh you know it's probably it's probably pretty unusual <laughs> 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 but uh you know it might it might not be necessarily i think i think uh it's probably more common in the countries that are so the way that the industry is set up which is kind of becoming a bit more public knowledge and which the film doesn't really go into but uh you know i kind of I mean, I talk about this a lot of Q and A's, and and part of me wishes I'd put it into the film, um, but I also I I had written like a an article that I was trying to get published in some magazines and stuff, which never ended up getting published. Kind of about how the industry works, and and basically like you know monkeys kind of because because the trade in in primates, uh, specifically like macaques, who are the you know the most commonly traded non-human primates. Uh, in the world, um, basically the the um, the transport of monkeys, like the trade in monkeys that are caught in the wild, is is really regulated. And because you know, you kind of if you want to keep trading monkeys, I mean, you can you can keep breeding them, but eventually, like you know, inbreeding becomes a problem, and and there are certain things that kind of become problematic if you're just going to keep breeding the same population. Um, so, uh, you know, catching more monkeys from the wild becomes, uh, becomes important for, for that industry. So, uh, in Laos, those monkeys are basically like, I mean, they've been captured in the wild, but they're kind of like, they're just like scrub clean. They don't have, they don't have an identity when they get there. They come from farms, so they just kind of say well they're from this farm you know like they're they don't uh and what we discovered in our investigation was that there's there's really no uh there's none of the farms use reliable methods of identification uh most of them don't use any 
any identification on the mo- on the monkeys. Uh, some of them might use like removable neck tags or something like that, uh, but those are useless. And and with a lack of enforcement, I mean, it's even you know they might as well just not use anything. Um, it's you know some people suggest well they should tattoo them or whatever. I mean that would fix the problem of like knowing where they come from, but uh, obviously it doesn't. It doesn't stop the trade. So, yeah. so the monk the monkeys from Laos are are uh, shipped to the Chinese and Vietnamese companies who have even bigger breeding facilities. Uh, there's a there's a breeding facility in uh, in Vietnam that I think is suppo- supposed to be uh, like fifty thousand monkeys. Like it's just so many. Like oh, just God. a giant. Yeah, just like a giant. A uh, giant monkey farm on the scale that you know you you might think of like a chicken farm or something like that. Um, yeah, and uh, and so those companies are able to basically like circumvent international trading guidelines by saying you know well you know the monkeys came from Laos and they were uh, bred in a farm and that's what we know. And uh, and then they're sent to uh, to research institutions all around the world with that kind of uh, that kind of like clean history. So so what's the legality with the transportation? Uh, I mean, it's it's legal to trans it's legal to transport them as long as they're not wild caught now. Here's this is the problem. We know that we know that they're wild caught. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have it on tape that they're wild caught. <laughs> um, the The problem is uh, CITES, as as well intentioned as it is, uh, it's kind of like other things that are like related to the UN or whatever. Like it's it's mostly like. It's like a nice thing to talk about, but they don't do a lot. Um, and the the enforcement when it comes to, you know, from from country to country is really is really difficult. And um, especially when you have uh, a country like Laos, where uh, you know people are really poor, um, the government is really corrupt. Uh, people who run businesses and who have money uh, can pretty much do whatever they want, um, which is, I mean, I guess it's not that different from here. Uh, <laughs> I'm making it sound like, oh, yeah, this this crazy land on the other side of the world sounds exactly like Canada or the U.S. But, uh, you know, like, there's a level of corruption there and a level of kind of untouchability of, of the people who are running this industry that is very, um, it's just, it, it makes solving quote unquote, solving the issue, uh, through regulation or whatever, or through law really, really difficult. I mean, the U S just put a, a $1 million reward on the, uh, basically for for any information leading to the capture of uh of one of the monkey farmers not not for farming monkeys but because he's also involved in trading uh rhino horns and so uh they you know the i mean there's a million dollar reward but i mean i i feel very doubtful that it'll lead to to the capture uh, of 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 this guy and the, and the shutdown of that industry, I think the thing that is probably a better uh, like a better strategy in which you know has has been getting more and more attention in recent years is like the the kind of the back end uh, transportation issue, which is like okay. Western research institutions need monkeys, quote unquote, need monkeys. Um, they uh, need to get them from that part of the world because that's, you know, again, like you can't just keep breeding the same gene pool over and over again. So you got to get more fresh ones. And 
uh, they're gonna they need to be transported by plane. It's just not practical to transport them <laughs> any other way. So uh, the the airline campaigns that have been going on are have really, I think, given a lot of pause for thought to a lot of um, uh, to a lot of airlines and to a lot of. I mean, the UK was talking about potentially getting the military to help out with transporting monkeys into the UK because so many airlines were saying uh, we're not going to transport them. Um, so I think that's kind of like a back end solution to. Uh, a problem that really doesn't have a meaningful like front front end solution like the research institutions are just going to keep saying we need monkeys the the people who are supplying them are just going to keep supplying them because it's a money thing like i mean the thing about those folks is that like yeah, i mean if they weren't selling monkeys they'd be selling what you know whatever the 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 fact that they're monkeys means nothing to them um so it, it's just a commodity so um you know i i don't think we can kind of attack things from a legal way uh on the on the front end i think i think the back end way where a lot of campaigning has been happening seems to be really positive i know there's I've heard some discussion recently where I've heard some AR activists say, like, well, do we know the airline campaigns are really effective? I'm just like, I mean, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, do we know they're really effective? I mean, yeah, there's still monkeys in labs. There's still uh, monkeys being transported, but it's been effective enough that the industry itself is saying, like, uh, you know, we got to do something about this. Like these campaigns are fucking us over. So, in uh, three words or less, how do you uh, solve this? <laughs> uh, more raw protests. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> Sorry, I know I tend to ramble. Give me, give me more. Like in three words or less, or like. Uh... <laughs> I just like it's like such a complex problem. Like yeah. it's not like there's an easy solution. Mm -hmm. It's just it's one of those ones that's so fucked. Yeah, but you know, it it really it really does boil down to like supply and demand, I think. Like the the reason that we can't really like police the or like the reason that we can't really affect the demand is that uh it's not um the thing about vivisection is that it's not like a consumer issue. Like we can't, I mean, I know people debate like veganism as, uh, as a consumer issue, but like if everybody did stop eating meat, like they would really not be able to keep breeding animals for food. Like you just, you just can't if you're yeah. not getting, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it is a supply and demand issue, but as consumers or as like just regular people who aren't involved in the, in science, like there's not a whole, we can have a lot, we can have, I, and I always tell this to activists too, like we can have a lot of feelings. We're allowed to have all the feelings we want, but like we can't, we gotta be honest. Like we can't affect demand for lab animals. We don't set that. We have nothing to do with it. It's not up to us. So we got to think of other ways to like get around the issue. We can, again, we can have lots of feelings about it, but we need to be like really clear on like what we can actually, you know, what, what end of things we can actually have an effect on. And I think that that, that the airline campaigns are like one way that we can affect supply. We can't, we can't really fuck with demand all that much. Um, but we can really fuck with supply and people have been, and I think that that's good. So, uh, I can't believe it's already been an hour, but, um, I really wanted to talk to you about anarchism <laughs> it's too. Fucking, it's cause I talk a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it's been good. It's been just, the time has flown. Um, so since we didn't get to talk about anarchism and I really wanted to, three words or less thoughts. Uh, listen to propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, but seriously, they're they're 
fucking sharp guys and the, their albums are like uh are like books and i i strongly encourage people who uh, they also tend to with a lot of their albums like have like reading lists in them which are amazing so i i strongly encourage anyone who's in it, who's like anarcho curious to like check out some propaganda albums and check out some of their like recommended reading awesome so uh, how can people connect with you uh i <laughs> it's a, it's you know making a feature film has been a really great lesson in like how much people don't understand what goes into making a film or like what like like i've had people be like you you know yeah, so uh, can I, like, uh, intern at, like, Decipher Films? <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> you, mean, like, you mean, like, intern, like, in my my room? <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you want to do? Like, if, I mean, if you want to answer emails for me, sure, but, like, you can, can you do that at your place? <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, people... Uh, the email addresses that are on, you know, the website for the film, MaximumToleratedDose.org, uh, the email address on there just goes right to me, uh, so people can always connect with me that way. Uh, I got rid of my Facebook account, so forget about that. And, uh, um, well, the Facebook page for the film still exists, but uh, I don't, I don't want to have any friends on there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I'm over Facebook. For now you're gonna being. get them because you asked not to. <laughs> well, nobody knows my like. Nobody knows my like my like dummy account name. So <laughs> I'm purposely keeping it with no friends. So it's fine. I just use it to like admin pages and stuff like that. Anyway, people can people can find me uh, on the maximum tolerated dose dot org uh, site and. Uh, yeah, it's it's easy to get a hold of me, and people do all the time. So <laughs> don't be don't be shy, and uh, yeah, and don't worry. There's I, like there's no interns or there's no employees. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> See, we need a new intern though. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> See, you guys can have an intern though, because you guys are like you have things to organize. I like this is just my life. <laughs> I can't, I, like, I would feel stupid being like, hey, man, can you, like, answer these emails for me? Because they're, like, addressed to me or, like, what? Well, I don't know. It just feels weird. You guys can do that because you guys have, like, a weekly show, and I think that that, I think that, that makes sense. But for me, it's just, it's like, somebody would just be looking at me like, there's no, there's no, like, upward movement. <laughs> you know, it's not like if someone, like, interned long enough, they could become, like, an, any, an anything. They'll never be paid. <laughs> there will never be, like, a paid position or, like, they they'll never get to, a a, you know. You guys can at least be like, you know what, you've been interning long enough. Like, you, why don't you try hosting? Or do you want to do this? Or whatever, you know, like, you yeah. can... <laughs> like I can't do that. So There's no just, money in it. Though. It's just oh, I I, I know. I'm not <laughs> I just mean like you know there there can at least be some movement in terms of like skills or like learning new stuff. I feel like if I got an intern, it would just be like it would just be like a fucked up labor situation. <laughs> That's the whole point of an intern, though, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh man, yeah, if Internville USA, it's that's like everyone's, everyone's yeah, everyone's an intern there. <laughs> everyone's an intern in the in the US now. I was actually reading I'm going to stop rambling, but I was reading yesterday about like the highest paid interns in the US mm -hmm. cuz I guess some interns at some like big tech companies are still they still get paid, but apparently if you're an intern at Twitter, you make $7,000 a month. What? I I'd like, take that. I was like, dude, I will be, I will get the most coffee for you. <laughs> that you, you I will get the shit out of that coffee for seven thousand yeah. dollars. For seven thousand dollars, like I could make a film a year on that kind of money. It's crazy. I'm crazy. fucking speechless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was just like, what? That's great. How do I become a Twitter intern? <laughs> I like Twitter. <laughs> Who doesn't? Jesus fuck. Yeah. 
anyway, I don't know. I don't know how many thousands of dollars you pay your intern per month, but um, you know, maybe we, we don't make let it them... fair since we're don't... anarchists. We'll pay you exactly what we make. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just don't let them listen to this part of the podcast. Be like, yeah, yeah, the podcast was over after. <laughs> No. Yeah. no, they make no, no, exactly no. what we make, which is nothing. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, that's fair. Well, we like to we like to end every episode saying "fuck shit, damn." So, could you could you honor us with your words? Fuck shit, damn. <laughs> thank you, no, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's been it's been awesome. And uh, if you ever need uh, ever need a spot to rest yourselves in Canada, let me know or <laughs> let me know, and I'll definitely let other people know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. The same goes for Salt Lake. Yep. If you're ever in Salt Lake, hook us up. You know what? I want to go to Salt Lake sometime. I've heard I've heard actually really really great things about it. There, oh, it's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no one from there has said good things. I just mean people, <laughs> people visiting there have been like, oh, yeah, it's a great place to visit. I mean, that's that's good enough for me. It, yeah, it's good for like a week, a day. <laughs> <laughs> a day. It's good for a week, a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, t- take it easy. All right, have a good night, guys. Right, okay. See you later. Bye. 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 Gotta go pee? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um. This week we heard Grammatic, Muy Tranquilo. Right now you're listening to Big Crit Country Rap Tunes. And as always, El Comandante's Which Side Are You On? I always sing. I don't know why. I gotta not do that. It's a lot of floor and food. Reese flowing through your brains. What? What? <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> to your brains, not your veins. Your brains. Uh, please remember to like and not like. Yeah, you can like us. Yeah, but uh, I was talking about iTunes. You don't like on iTunes. You should have just flowed with it. You should have been like us on Facebook. I should have. I'm not that talented yeah. yet. Okay, so you can rate and review us. Rate and review us on iTunes. It helps us get us more listeners. Mm-hmm. Uh, like us on our Facebook page. That's what follow, you do on Facebook? Yeah. And you follow on Twitter. Follow on Twitter. Um, you follow on Tumblr. Is that what you, is that what you do on Tumblr is follow? Mm-hmm. Okay, what do you do on, on Instagram? You follow. It's just a follow thing. Mm-hmm. Do all of those. Mm-hmm. And um, if you have Google+. Plus, our friends on MySpace. We don't have MySpace. No, we don't have MySpace. And if, if, if you have Google+, Plus, you need to question everything question authority no i mean you need to question yourself and where your life is heading well in the positive i'm hoping if you have a google plus account it's positive it's nope one two three four positive nope not at all google plus gets your search ranks up <laughs> it's amazing how they're oligarchy does that yeah <laughs> so weird just having a social media account with them can do that <laughs> fuck shit damn fuck it which side is produced by the which side media collective